UFC 298, Volkanovski versus Tapuria takes place this weekend, and I'm going to go through the entire card, starting with the early prelims, ending with the main event, giving my prediction and breakdown for every single fight on the card, starting with the early prelim opener of Andrea Lee versus Miranda Maverick. Now, this is an interesting one because there's a part of me that doesn't mind the underdog of Andrea Lee. And if more money starts coming in on Miranda Maverick and Andrea Lee does become even bigger of an underdog, I might advise people to put some money on her because she has fought a better strength of competition than Miranda Maverick. But I think Miranda Maverick's the more improving fighter. She's the younger fighter. She's training at Team Elevation. Remember, Man Miranda Maverick earlier in her career was still juggling her education along with her mixed martial arts career. Now she's full force at Team Elevation. I think we're going to see the best version of her that we've seen yet. Um, I do worry about her in terms of damage in this fight, but I think she will be able to out-grapple Andrea Lee in this fight. There seems to be an Andrea Lee where when she gets taken down sometimes, she gets annoyed and you can almost see the frustration on her face. There's not a calmness when she ends up on bottom position. There's like a frantic, eh, get off me. It's not much of a, okay, I'm on my, bot on my back. I need to get to the cage and get my hips under me. Like there's no calmness. So she definitely doesn't want to be there. I think Miranda Maverick will be able to get her takedowns in this fight. I was thinking to myself, well, you know, Miranda Maverick only got one takedown against Macy Barber. Andrea Lee got a bunch. But Miranda Maverick only really went for a few takedowns. I think she only went for one. And another time she ended up on top of Macy Barber at the end of one of the rounds. I thought she won that Macy Barber fight. Now, there's also an argument that Andrea, that Andrea Lee won her fight with Macy Barber. Um, but they want Macy Barber as champ. So, both lost. Um, I actually think it could have been scored Macy's way in the Andrea Lee fight in terms of damage. But for some reason, in women's MMA, all of a sudden, takedowns really count. Um, Miranda Maverick, I think, has got to get this one done. I think she's coming into her prime. Still got a lot to learn. 26 years old. I think she'll be able to beat an over-the-hill Andrea Lee, who hasn't really looked in good form recently. We move on. Up the card to another fight. Oban Elliott versus Val Woodburn. The Welsh gangster himself, another Welshman in the UFC, representing Orban Elliott. I reckon he will beat Val Woodburn. Now, there was a part of me that thinks, well, Val Woodburn's a fucking ball of muscle and, it's, and Orban Elliott is hittable on the feet. He is hittable on the feet. Um... He's not as big as his uh, stats would suggest. I think it's not going to be six foot versus five foot seven. I think it's going to be a lot closer in terms of size in this fight, especially in terms of frame as well. Um, Woodburn actually has a reach advantage while being way shorter than Urban Elliott as well. Urban Elliott, of course, has fought at lightweight before. Now at welterweight, fought a huge dude on the contender series, took an absolute beating off him in one of the rounds, I believe it was, and then came back in the others and got top control and, you know, really grinded out a hard-earned victory against, which we've got to acknowledge, a really dangerous guy that he had to fight on the contender series. I didn't think he was going to win it. You know, I mean, I really didn't. Like, he ended up fighting a 16-4 and four Brazilian dude, all fast twitch muscle. Guy's now 26 years old. Big dude coming off a win now since losing on the Contender Series. Was coming off some good wins before it as well. Um, but Orban Elliott, I think if this fight leaves the first few exchanges, he has a massive advantage in terms of skill over Val Woodburn. Look at Val Woodburn's record. I was just mentioning who Orban Elliott fought. I know Val Woodburn fought Bo Nickel. If you look at the wins that, that Val Woodburn has on his record, you might see some records on his record of like 30 and 16 and 17 and 8. And oh, this guy, these guys had some experience. Too much experience living, I think. Way too much experience living. Um, they're old people. They're way past it. Val Woodburn is winning, and he was undefeated going into the Bo Nickel fight. I get it. But Orban Elliott, I, I think we're looking at a different strength of schedule. Even though he fought Bo Nickel, he still got smoked easily. Like, really badly in the first round. Of course, it got to him the moment. It was a big fight out of nowhere in his career on short notice. I get that. Um, but I, again, I don't really like people moving down a division. Even though this is his division, I don't like a weight cut after 
a brutal KO loss. You know, he's back before Bo Nickel is. So I'm going to go Oban Elliott getting this one done by decision over Val Woodburn. Maybe an arm triangle submission in the late second or third round. Something like that instead. We move on. Josh Quinlan versus Danny Barlow. I'm going with Danny Barlow. If I'm not mistaken, I'm going to double check this right now. Danny Barlow was supposed to be fighting someone else here. He was supposed to fight Yusaku Kinoshita on this card. And Kusaku Kinoshita took, uh, pulled out of the fight. Josh Quinlan is now in the fight. I don't think Josh Quinlan is good. Simply don't think he's good. He's athletic. And honestly, at this point in MMA and some of the higher divisions especially, being athletic can get you to the UFC. It can get you to the Contender Series. And uh, Josh Quinlan had a wicked win, you know, in his UFC debut, I believe it was, by KO. Nice win. It might have been on the Contender Series, though. I'm not entirely sure if it was Contender Series or Apex. It's hard to tell the difference these days when you're watching back fights. Um, no, it was in the, in his debut, but it was against Jason Witt, who I know I picked him against. Um, but Jason Witt is prone to an early KO, it seems like. So I'm going to take a little bit of value away from that. Uh, Danny Barlow is nasty work. Nasty, nasty work. The guy he fought on the Contender Series was also a really good prospect in his own right. Um, Raheem Forrest, I'm going to look it up right now. Raheem Forrest, very good fighter. Actually uh, is a guy who um, had a win over Radke, who then went on to be in the... Uh, a loss to Radke, sorry, who then went on to be in the UFC. He actually beat Donovan Beard, who was the guy who ended up fighting Bo Nickel on the Contender Series, the second guy that Bo Nickel fought on the Contender Series. Um, Danny Barlow's been beating some decent opponents, and he's really hyped up for good reason. He's got wicked ability on the feet explosive but also composed he throws kicks at range he doesn't just get scrappy and swing punches which was kind of the downfall of that forest guy that he ko'd on the uh, contender series i just think he's got more weapons than josh quinlan we saw the limitation of josh quinlan's weapons against trey waters where he had no way whatsoever of landing on trey waters i get it trey waters is a way taller dude Way taller dude than uh, Josh Quinlan. Way longer range as well. Um, I do want to say Danny Barlow has a seven-inch reach advantage here. Um, Quinlan has a very short arms. Um, and Quinlan was just sort of stuck on the outside, and he couldn't do anything about it. I think Danny Barlow will be able to keep him at range and sting him with vicious shots. So I'm going to go with brutal first-round KO by Danny Barlow, who I think is actually a very good prospect. We move on, up the card, to the prelims. Zhang, Mingyang Zhang versus Brendson Ribeiro. I've actually done quite a bit of research on this uh, fight, because this was a tricky one to predict. I am going to go with Ribeiro over Zhang Mingyang. I've, it's going to be a finish. There's, I don't see this going to a decision. Someone's getting finished. Zhang Wei, uh, Mingyang Zhang, Jesus Christ, Mingyang Zhang, Dangerous finisher, has ability to go to the ground if things get tricky on the feet um, against a certain caliber of opponent. I do want to bring that up. Some of the opponents that this guy has been fighting. Listen, Brenson Ribeiro's lost to some bad... I think he lost to a 13 and 10 fighter by KO. Like, Zhang Mingyang has been KO'd by a really trash record of guys too. They've both got some cans on their record. Am I wrong in saying I trust a Western can over an Eastern can? Am I wrong in saying that? I think I trust it more. Ribeiro has fought better opponents as well, record-wise. That needs to be mentioned. And the guy that he fought on the Contender Series was supposed to go on to become something. You know, people don't take that into consideration. It wasn't just, ah, these two guys, uh, like heavyweight on the Contender Series, scrapping it out. The guy he fought, I believe his surname was Lopez. I'm going to find out. I did all research for this yesterday, but the Super Bowl was on. So I was like, why would I post it? The Super Bowl is going to take all the attention. Um, Bruno Lopez was the guy on the Contender Series. Undefeated, well-trained, in his prime. I think he was like a minus couple hundred favorite. I think Ribeiro was like a plus 400 or 300. Something along those lines. 
Like, he was supposed to lose that fight, and he still pulled it off with a brutal KO win in the first round. He's a very dangerous guy, Ribeiro. And one thing I like about this fight is that Ribeiro, he can throw straight punches while they're throwing hooks. That's the range difference we're talking about here. Similar height between the two of them. Ribeiro's got an 81-inch reach. Zhang Mingyang's got 75 and a half. I like that for Ribeiro if things get a little scrappy and they start trade. I can honestly see Ribeiro tagging Zhang, uh, Mingyang Zhang with a straight right as Mingyang Zhang goes for a hook. Yeah, I was watching back their fights, though. I was watching back uh, Zhang, Mang, Mingyang Zhang's fight. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Mingyang Zhang's fights. And um, he looks good. He looks good. He's got ability. I watched him on the road to UFC. I watched him on WLF. I watched him against a guy. I'm going to find the name of him just before I even came on here. I've been going through some of the fights that you can find of him on YouTube. I watched him against Anding Ma, who's one of the better recorded fighters that was on his resume. It was an open weight fight. The guy had, I believe, 10, 10 like kg on him, like a big dude. But he was just a fat guy, like a big fat guy. And the guy was like catching Ming Yang Zhang with head kicks. It's not like this guy's moments of success against Ming Yang Zhang was grinding him against a cage and trying to get on top position. In fact, Ming Yang Zhang got on top and got the rear naked choke in that fight. Um, the guy was like quicker than him on the feet for a moment. I don't like that against Ribeiro, who's all fast twitch muscle. I think he's just a little bit faster at a more dangerous range than Ming Yang Zhang is. So I'm going to go with Brenson Ribeiro finding this one by KO. The only worry is that maybe Ming Yang Zhang's got a ground game a bit better than it looks on paper against the cans that he's doing it against. And maybe then he takes down Ribeiro. Um, but I trust Ribeiro to get this one done. I think he'll win this one by KO in this fight. I think this is going to be a sick fight though, so pay attention to it. But I am going to go over Ribeiro. The, the opponents Ming Yang Zhang has been on, uh, some of them. Jesus Christ, man. I mean, they are bad. They are real bad, so... I'm going to rate Ribeiro's wins a little bit better. We move on. Uh, and also, Ming Yang Zhang was supposed to be in the UFC a few times already. This is why I like the mentality of um, Brenson Ribeiro here over um, Ming Yang Zhang. Ming Yang Zhang was supposed to be in the UFC a few times already. It's been cancelled. He was supposed to fight in Australia, supposed to fight somewhere else. That got cancelled as well. Now he's trying to get his debut. Like This has been a frustrating process for him to get his UFC debut. Ribeiro won his contender series fight. Voyala, he's on the card against Ming Yang Zhang. This is more of a natural turn of events for him over Ming Yang Zhang. So I'm going to go Brenson Ribeiro. We move on. Rinya Nakamura versus Carlos Vera. Hi. Rinya Nakamura, you know. It's a tough one. It's tough to draw the card of Rinya Nakamura. Especially, yeah. When you are just one of the terrible guys from the uh, Ultimate Fighter. these are, This is one of the guys I was roasting being on tough. I'm like, dude, he's 35 years old. Why are you bringing him on tough? I, he's not a prospect. You know what I mean? We're, I'm trying to plead with the Ultimate Fighter. Like, why the fuck are you doing this? Why are you doing this? Um, but they brought him in. He lost to Brad Katona. I think Rinya Nakamura has got better grappling potential than Brad Katona does. Honest opinion, I think he does. Um, Rinya Nakamura's nasty. On the feet, there's some work that needs to be done. There really is some work that needs to be done on the feet. But I love his grappling, man. He's got great control. He's just, his jiu-jitsu's coming along. His striking's coming along as well. He is dangerous on the feet. Very dangerous, but he is open. But he's wickedly dangerous. Fast twitch muscle, knockout ability. But that's going to give Carlos Vera his chance here. Um... I'm just going to have to side with uh, the grappling of Rinya Nakamura. I mean, this is just a bit of a mismatch, in my opinion. Like, this is an older dude, had his injuries, lost on tough, shouldn't be in the UFC, but here they are, building Rinya Nakamura's name. I'm going to go Rinya. He could get a KO early. He could also get a ground him out decision win where he just ragdolls this dude. I do think his grappling is... He does. He needs to work on a lot, Rinya Nakamura. He needs to work on finishing from dominant positions on the ground and also getting off some ground and pound as well. I think a lot of these wrestlers go for position so much. And I'm like, dude, this could have been finished if you weren't fighting for this choke for the last two minutes. 
throw like 20 unanswered ground and pound shots and it gets called off. So he does have some things to work on, but this old man ain't beating Rinya Nakamura. We move on. Up the card, Marcos Rogerio de Lima versus Justin Tuffer. Ooh. I have been going back and forth on this one. I've been going back and forth. Is it time to stop doubting Justin Tuffer is the big question here. I think it is. He's coming into his prime. Way more experienced now. Remember, this is a guy who really did learn MMA in front of us. The guy's record is 7-3. and three, And he's been in the UFC since 2019. That is insane. Lost to Jorgen De Castro, of course, got flatline KO'd. Um, beat Juan Adams. Welcome to the club. Harry Hunsucker. Like, he really did get the Samoan treatment of absolute cans. Lost to Jared Vandera, though. This is why it's not as fucking simple. Lost to Carlos Felipe. This is why it's not as fucking simple as just going, ah, Tafa wins, man. Beat Austin Lane. Great KO. What happens if you don't get that KO, though, man? You lose to Jared Vandera and you lose to Carlos Felipe, even though he arguably could have won that Carlos Felipe fight. This is where I worry about Justin Tuffer. Um, I, I'm gonna. It's so. T it's such a flip. This fight is such a coin flip. But you know what? I'm gonna lean towards Tuffer. I don't mind Rodrigo de Lima as an underdog. Momentum. Tuffer coming off some wins, uh, a win. Got some momentum, and Marcos Rodrigo de Lima coming off a KO loss to Derek Lewis, where he took a lot. Ah, but it was a flying knee, and he took a lot after that as well. And he didn't go out cold. Now, we'll go Justin Tuffer. Fuck it. So annoying, that fight. So annoying, that fight. Because it's genuinely like, no one knows. But I'll take the momentum of Tuffer, the improvements of him, over the stagnation of Marcos Rodrigo de Lima, I guess. We move on. Up the card. Amanda Lemos versus Mackenzie. Ah, oh, Marcos Rodrigo de Lima was out grappling like. Yeah. Now, Waldo Cortez Acosta's out landing him on the feet. Don't care if he got the takedowns. If you're letting Waldo's fat ass land that much on you, Tafa's knocking you out. Tafa KO. We move on. Amanda Lemos versus Mackenzie Dern. I'm going Amanda Lemos. Going Amanda Lemos. Mackenzie Dern cannot strike. Has never been able to strike. I'm really bright right now. Let me refocus back up. Has never been able to strike. Awful on the feet. Never thrown a punch in her life. Never trained to throw a punch in her life. Amanda Lemos is a, a dangerous... She's Amanda. You know what I mean, we've been over this before. It's a key name that doctors give out at birth when they don't know. Um, Amanda Lemos. Powerful. Dangerous on the feet. And one thing that I really like about her in this matchup as well. Did she just get dominated by Zhang Weili in the wrestling? Yes, she did. What's the one thing she's going to go back to the gym and be like, I need to fucking work on this desperately? So her grappling defense. We've not seen Mackenzie don't have a ton of success getting people to the ground before. And when we have, we've seen people to survive on the ground against her by not making silly mistakes. I'm not going to... After watching how Mackenzie Doan looked against Jessica and Draj, I don't trust her to win a fight ever again. So I'm going to go Amanda Lemos. Um, dangerous, power puncher, came up against Zhang Wei Li. That's a tough one. I'm going to go Amanda Lemos getting a brutal KO over Mackenzie Dern. TKO stoppage, round one. Dern has never practiced striking for MMA in her entire life. You can't convince me otherwise. Amanda Lemos gets it done, TKO. We move on. Anthony Hernandez versus Roman Kopilov. It comes down to this. I was saying Rob Font's going to expose Adrian Yanez. 
I was saying that Aljo was going to beat Peter Yan. I was saying, well, that when in the first fight happened, then the rematch, I was like, split decision, maybe split decision. Nobody count out Aljo here. But I still went with Yan. God. Um, I was saying that Jack Hermanson is going to beat Joe Pfeiffer. And I keep switching these picks, man. I'm going Anthony Hernandez over Roman Kopilov. And I know that's going to be not a nice thing for a lot of Kopilov enjoyers to hear. I know there's a big Kopilov enjoyer fan base out there. So maybe this just puts something on the line in that matchup. I think there's a reason he's an underdog here. He's up against it style-wise with Anthony Hernandez. Now I know. Since he switched gyms and gone to the Mecca of Russia on the uh, mountain sides to train his wrestling. He has been doing a lot better and his hands have been looking a lot better and a lot more confident on the feet. But at the same time, this guy was out grappled and subbed by Carl Robeson. Early in his career, I get it. But Roman Kopilov is 32. I know he looks like testosterone having Chase Hooper, but he's over 30. Like, and he didn't start his career too early, but he does have a background in the uh, combat world of Russia. You know, master of this, master of that. But I don't like the fact that he got out grappled by Carl Robeson. I really don't like that. And then Duraev had moments where he out grappled him as well. Um, not too often, though. He did show decent takedown defense. But then again, Duraev, we haven't seen amazing work from him in the grappling. I think Anthony Hernandez is one of the more underrated middleweights outside the rankings right now. The dude has been looking sick. Really, really sick in his fights. Lost to Kevin Holland early. Not the best fight for him to take. He was coming off a win, loss, lost to Marcus Perez, um, which don't look good for him, right? Um, as I was just talking about um, Roman Kopilov's loss. Beat uh, Park Yun Yong, which I think has aged quite well. You know, he actually ended up getting a submission against Park Kin Yong. I think that aged pretty well. Park Kin Yong is a very good middleweight outside the rankings, technical, uh, technique-wise. Lost to Kevin Holland. But since then, survives Rodolfo Vieira on the ground, subs him, hands him his loss in his career, um, beats Marc-Andre Barriol, ragdolls him in that fight. Eight, eight takedowns he had in that fight. Going from position to position, making Mark Andre or Barry Alt break, beat Josh Fremd, ragdolled him in that fight as well. Submission attempt, traverse to this, change to this, take the back, get this position. The way he does this to guys, it, I feel bad for him. I'd really feel bad for him. Um, and in 2023, beat Edmund Shabazian by just ragdolling him. Edmund had moments early with power and strength in the pocket. That's Edmund's best round is round one. But eventually he succumbed to Anthony Hernandez, who started to ragdoll him. He ragdolls people with a crazy pace. And I think he'll be able to do it to Kopilov because I've been saying this about Kopilov for a while. I think he's technical, wicked ability, love his dynamicness on the feet. Um, but I've been saying this about him. I'm sorry to say it. Alessio de Chirico's a bum. Josh Fremd is a bum. On the feet especially. Uh, Claudio Ribeiro, nothing special. And Ribeiro had moments against him. Are we forgetting that? Ribeiro was doing all right. Like he was staying in there. Kopilov was out striking him, don't get me wrong. But Ribeiro rocked him at the end of round one. You know, it wasn't a clear win. Like it was a clear win. He got a head kick KO, I get it. But it wasn't a clean, unscathed win for Roman Kopilov. He had trouble and resistance in that fight. And I think once he meets resistance... If it's enough to take Josh Fremd into the late second round, and it's enough to take Ribeiro into the second round, and it's enough to take Alessio de Chirico into the third round, this guy ain't a first round kill him and get out win. That's not what he is. And I think that's what he needs to be against Anthony uh, uh, Hernandez. And I think if it does get into the second round, we've seen Kopilov against um, his most recent opponent in Josh Fremd breathing a little. Ooh, breathing, shaking out his arms at the end of round two before he finally puts the, the pieces together and finishes friend with a body shot. The body is open for Hernandez, and I would advise body shots for Roman Kopilov, but I do think Hernandez is going to be able to outgrapple him. I love his grappling. Really love his grappling. And I think even if Anthony Hernandez can't outgrapple him, he'll be better off cardio-wise, 
failing takedowns and making Roman Kopilov defend them, then Kopilov will be by defending them. I think his cardio is that good. So I'm going to go Anthony Hernandez um, getting a finish in round three or two. We move on. Up the card. Marab Devlashvili versus Henry Cejudo. I'm going with Marab. I'm going with Marab against Cejudo. You're giving Marab a size advantage. Like a, a frame advantage. Four inches of reach. Two inches of height. I might make a whole video on this because I saw Cejudo fired his fucking coach on Countdown. And now Marab's got that coach in his corner. If Cejudo's pulling off a genius play, all I'm saying, why are Marab and Cejudo's coach running into each other? If Cejudo's pulled that off, I'm going to fake fire you on Countdown. I bet you he'll buy it and try and play it off and bring you over to his team. And you get a glance at what's going on. I would not be surprised, even though it could just be cringe and Cejudo making a weird decision to fire his coach on a countdown episode. Don't mind the idea of that conspiracy. But I'm going to go with Marab. Cejudo's 37 now. I know he looks 12. He's 37. He's getting up there. Been around. He's also been not active recently either. And his fight against Aljamain Sterling... I reckon he could have actually got the win against Aljo if he was more active before that fight. But he looked like he was overthinking everything he did. As soon as he realized Aljo could grapple with him, he overthought everything he did on the feet. Before, Suhudo had this confidence on the feet. No one's going to take him down. No one's going to keep him down. I'm going to be able to do whatever I want on the feet. I can be comfortable here because no one's ever going to get me down. As soon as Aljo changed that reality for him he looked like he was second guessing everything he did on the fit he threw everything unsure if he put a little bit more pot behind his shots he could have maybe got a finish on aljo in that fight because the shots were there to land um but he looked unsure of everything hesitated didn't want to let right hands go i think if marab starts out grappling him even if Marab's not getting the back or not getting mounts or not getting half guard and locking down Cejudo, even if Cejudo's getting back up, the fact that he's being taken down and he's having to work the wrestling, I think is going to uh, annoy him and make him a little bit more open on the feet. Marab's got not that bad stand up. It's not great. It's not slick and smooth like Sandhagen, but it works for him. The amount he throws against yet. Yeah, Dude, he 5-0'd Peter Yan. I know, I know I deny it and I hate it and I'm a Marab de Velashvili existence denier. But he's really good. Likely on EPO. Monstrous cardio. And you're giving him a size and mass advantage over Suhuda. I know Suhuda might be more explosive. I'm not trusting a finish for a reason why Suhudo wins. I'm going to trust what happens if this isn't a three-minute win. Marab's likely going to win this one. I know that Sudo's an Olympian. I get it. Well, Marab's inbred, so beat that. You know what I mean? I don't care what medal you have. Marab's going to out-grapple uh, out him, put a pace on him, and just even if he doesn't put a pace on him, hold him up against that cage near his thigh, annoy Sahuda, and I think we're going to see a very annoyed Sahuda. If he wins, great for Bantamweight, great for O'Malley. He'll probably be like, oh, yeah, I'll take Sahudo now. Um, but Marab, I reckon, will get this one done. We move on. Jeff Neal versus Ian Gary. I'm going Jeff Neal. I'm doing it. I'm putting it all on the line. You can't get dropped by Takashi Sato and expect me not to pick Jeff Neal to finish you off. I don't like that from Ian Gary. And this is not a hatred-based pick because I have been going back and forth on this one. And um, I was actually picking Luke to beat Ian Gary as well, was I not? I'm not sure if I was. Maybe I switched on that one as well. But I think for definitely a period of time, I was picking Luke to catch him. Because I've watched back a lot of Ian Gary fights. He's a great fighter to watch. And he's someone that is a contentious person in the sport, the cuck. Um, so you watch a lot of Ian Gary. You find yourself ingesting a lot of Ian Gary content. Um, if only his wife would ingest some of, uh, some of Ian Gary. But she's busy ingesting others. Um, but Ian Gary... Had a few fights cancelled. Was supposed to fight um, Luke at UFC 296. It got delayed. He's had to restart his fight camp. I just think it's not ideal for him. At the end of the day, I feel bad for him in terms of not his life decisions, but uh, what has happened to his life. Like he's been 
outcasted by the MMA community. They're all slandering him now. He's lost all his fans pretty much. There are some, I'm sure, that are rooting for him. Um, but he's now in Brazil. He's had to find a new gym. Not probably settled in there too well. I know they're doing all the high fives and stuff, but he hasn't been there for long. I'd like Jeff Neal here getting this one done. And I know Jeff Neal lost to Neil Magna, but there's different Jeff Neals. And I think when the right challenge comes up, that Jeff Neal knows is going to be a threat and knows he's going to be a high risk, high reward, you see the best of him. We saw that against Shavkat Rachmanov. One sick takedown defense. He, Jeff Neal decides where this fight goes. I don't think he's going to be shooting takedowns on Ian Gary. It might not harm him. I think he could mix one in or maybe try and work the clinch against Ian Gary up against the cage. But the main thing is, the kicks of Ian Gary are very good. The body kick is really good. The low kicks. Jeff Neal deals with low kicks quite well. He has a very high guard, so the body kicks are going to be there. But I think he can take them. I think he's tough enough to take a few. Um, the head kick, I don't think will be there. Jeff Neal, very high guard. Recovers well after getting hurt as well. We've seen him wobbled, and he stays safe. And I don't think Ian Gary's going to transition into a standing rear naked choke with one leg out. You know what I mean? Like, I think Jeff Neal's going to be able to survive him. I'm not going to bet on an Ian Gary TKO. I don't think he's actually a KO guy. He's had some on the regional scene that were pretty good. But since joining the UFC, he had one over Jordan Williams with a second to go in round one after arguably losing the start of that round. Didn't get one against Darian Weeks. Didn't get one against Gabe Green. Didn't get one against Neil Magny, even though at moments he really tried against a one-legged Magny to put him away with punches. It's like the kicks start the finishing exchange for Ian Gary, but the punches finished him. I don't think he's going to finish Jeff Neal. I think he's going to get caught on the chin like he gets caught. There's literally a video on YouTube called Ian Gary getting caught on the chin. And in every one of his fights... He gets stung because he's a tall, rangy dude, but he's got arms so short for his height. You know what I mean? He's a tall, rangy guy, 74 and a half inch reach. Jeff Neal is way shorter with a longer reach than him by half an inch. I think Jeff Neal's going to be able to tag him with some hooks when Ian Gary tries to get into a bit of a boxing exchange here and there, which I believe will happen in this fight. So I'm going to go best version of Jeff Neal we ever see. I think he catches Ian Gary after losing in moments and puts him away late round one or maybe uh, maybe in round two. We move on to another fight up the card. Robert Whitaker versus Paulo Costa. I'm going for Robert Whitaker here. I'm going for Whitaker over Paulo Costa. Um, Costa is good. I do think Costa has a really good chance because Whitaker doesn't deal well with a physicality difference. Frame difference, he can adjust. Israel Adesanya gave him sub problems, but he can adjust. Physicality difference are what takes a Whitaker clear win to a Whitaker loss or a Whitaker close win. I know a lot of people don't. There's a lot of Cannoneer Whitaker being close deniers out there. But if you watch back the Cannoneer Whitaker fight, Whitaker did better punches, but Cannoneer was really chopping at his leg in that fight and was doing quite good in the early rounds. It was not a dominant win for Whitaker in that fight. It really wasn't. He hurt Cannoneer in round three, got hurt in round three, but he hurt Cannoneer way worse. But Cannoneer had one arm in that fight. He broke his forearm in that fight and was out for ages afterwards. Um, Whitaker sometimes has a problem with physicality. But from what I've seen in Paulo Costa's career, I'm not trusting this dude ever again to accurately and effectively close the distance and track down opponents. He's way too open as he does it. Tough, yes. I think Whitaker's speed will shock him and stumble him off balance quite a bit and make him hesitant to try and close the distance. But I do think Whitaker's going to get this one done. Costa could. I can't watch you, even at altitude, right in front of Luke Rockhold, who's got his hands on his knees, bent over, and not be able to finish Luke Rockhold from that position. I, I just, I really did not like the Rockhold performance. And that's the most recent performance we have to go off of. I know it was altitude, but I really did not like the performance. I, I think he looked awful in that fight. I think both of them looked awful, which is why it was so fun. But I think this is going to be a Whitaker sting and move masterclass. He does have a chance to get finished. Again, physicality difference. 
You've got to have power, finishing ability. If you have finishing ability and size, you can beat Whitaker. Cannoneer made it competitive but lost. Uh, Duplessis beat Whitaker. Um, and then you see Whitaker school Kelvin Gastelum and school Marvin Vittori. Who, these guys don't have power, even though Vittori has more power than Joe Pfeiffer, who has more power than Francis Ngannou. Uh, you know how it works. Um, I'm going to go Whitaker, though. Just because Costa, I don't trust his knockout ability. Dangerous power. Throws heat. I get it. Look how competitive the Vittori fight was. Look at the Whitaker Vittori fight. Um, I know styles aren't everything, but it's it, it's a good tell on what level these guys are at compared to each other. Um, I just think Costa's too orthodox, which Whitaker will see coming, unlike Duplessis, who's very unorthodox and can shock people with his weird style. And I think Whitaker's going to pick at him. And Costa doesn't really KO guys. He's dropped Romero. Very impressive. I get it. Dropped people before. But it's a, an accumulative amount of damage that Costa does to people to eventually break them down. I think Whitaker moves too well. I love this being in the bigger cage, by the way. That's a huge part of this fight. If it was in the apex, I might not mind a Costa underdog pick. The fact that this is in the bigger cage and Whitaker's getting a reach advantage. Come on. I got Whitaker here. We move on. Up the card. Alexander Volkanovsky versus Ilya Tapuria. That's it. He's done. I'm going with Ilya Tapuria, man. Sad to say it, but it's kind of got to be said. Um, I feel like Ilya Tapuria gets this one done, man. I really do. I think Ilya Tapuria has got all of the weapons necessary to pull this one off. Um, fuck, man. Let me reply to this, dude. I think he's got all of the weapons to pull this one off. What am I even saying right now? Let me restart this whole breakdown. I got lost. Someone messaged me. Um, I've got Ilya Tapuria. Good everywhere. Tough. Good conditioning. There comes a time, yeah, where we always have questions about contenders. Can they do this? Can they do that? Can he do this? What What's his weakness here? Is this going to be a problem for him? Tapuria has had a rise that has successfully answered all of those uh, questions. He can grapple. He's got submissions. He started as a jiu-jitsu guy. Um, a lot of people don't know that. Um, great grappler, great jiu-jitsu, knockout power, volume ability, great body shots, good versatility. The only thing we don't know is how he deals too well with kicks, which is going to be a big tell here against Volkanovski. He throws a lot of low kicks. I think it's better for him to deal with Volkanovski's kicks than Yaya Rodriguez. It's a lot more Volk's only going to kick low. I don't think we've ever seen a kick from Volkanovski go above people's waist or stomach area. Um, he keeps them very low. Maybe he'll try him out on a shorter opponent here in Tapuria. Who knows? Um, but I think Tapuria is going to deal well with them. Love his boxing. Um, and he went five rounds with Emmett, no problem, and looked really in good condition in that fight. I know it's Josh Emmett. Um, who's not the best, but he's also very, very dangerous on the feet. And Tapiri was still able to find his pockets against a guy who could flatline KO him at any moment in Josh Emmett. That's impressive. I love watching a guy win a five-rounder against a KO artist who's got power all the way through a fight. But in this fight with Volkanovski, I don't think Volk's got the power to earn too much respect from Tapiri. His low kicks are going to be a factor, but I think the only reason that Tapiri was standing the way he was against Josh Emmett with that lead leg turned over, ready for low kicks, is because Emmett don't throw low kicks. And he knew that in that fight. Um, and he still didn't let get his leg destroyed, did he? Even though he was vulnerable to them. I think he'll adjust that for this fight with Volk. And I think Volk's going to have to fight this fight behind quite a bit. That's what I think is going to have to happen. I think Volk's going to be getting dropped. And that's going to lead him to no longer be able to just get ahead a little bit and then coast. And make a taller Holloway come to him. Or make a, make a Yaya Rodriguez start to get wild and leave openings for him. I, I think that's going to be a massive advantage here for Ilya Tapuria. He can have the power in the early exchanges to put himself ahead. And then make Volk have to fight, make Volk have to fight from behind. Which is what Volk had to do in the second fight with Holloway. Where arguably he looked his worst that he's ever looked recently with a full camp of course. I don't like the fact that Makashev just KO'd Volk brutally. I don't like the fact that Volk is crying. There's a lot that comes into this as well, mentally. Tapuria thinks he's the man. 
Tapiria thinks he's the fucking man right now. The king. No one's going to touch him. Not even this goat guy, Volkanovsky. No way Volk's going to touch him. That's in Ilya Tapiria's mind right now. To Volk just got KO'd, embarrassed, cried about it backstage, saying, I don't know why I was drinking so much before. I don't like what I'm hearing him. And these are all the red flags you could possibly have with a dominant champion. Drinking, day drinking every day, when you know Makashev's got a matchup coming up that you might need to be ready for. The only reason you snapped out of the drinking that you were doing is because the Makashev come, uh, matchup came up. You step up, you get KO'd badly, and now it's, oh, uh, anyway, uh, back down to featherweight. Let's do that weight cut all over again. A couple of months later against Ilya Tapuria. I don't like it for Volk. I really don't like it for Volk. I think he's more likely to be injured. I think he's more likely to have a suspect chin in this matchup. And I don't like the fact that Volk, who's traditionally a guy who has adjusted his entire style to fighting taller opponents, is now going to be fighting a shorter opponent because sometimes Volk leaves his chin up in the air when he steps in with his lead hand. And I can see Ilya Tapuria timing him over the top and catching that chin the way Chad Mendes did years ago. And then having the ability that Mendez doesn't to keep that pressure up and keep that ability going for longer than one round. I'm going with Ilya Tapuria getting this one done. Momentum is everything. I don't think there's been a champion 35 years old at the uh, lower divisions anyway. Um, so I'm going to side with all the uh, all the statistics that I think are in Ilya Tapuria's favor. KO, round two, Volk complains about an early stoppage. Like and subscribe. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.